All right. Hello, everyone who is on the line. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of E4C's 2018 Off-Grid Energy Webinar Series, focusing on why the power grid isn't everywhere, and particularly the role of grid extension in electricity access. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the president of Engineering for Change. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in will be archived on our webinars page and on our YouTube channel. Both of these links are included on the slide in front of you. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, Please feel free to contact the E4C webinar team, series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Also, if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, and development practitioners who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to our news and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, fellowships, funding calls, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please check out our website and sign up. So today's webinar is the second in the Off-Grid Energy series that we are sharing with you over the course of 2018 and 2019. Additional topics covered in the series are drawn from the book titled Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries, authored by our presenter, Dr. Henry Louis. The future webinars in this series are listed on this slide and will also be announced via our newsletter. Um, the, previously, uh, the previous webinar we had in this series is already available on our site as a recording. So if you missed it, you are welcome to go back and listen to it. That is the one on energy access and requirements of rural communities. E4C members will receive the information about all the webinars in this series directly in their inbox. So uh, definitely a good uh, motivation to sign up. For reference, you can find examples of off-grid energy products like the MobiSol Solar Home System in the E4C Solutions Library. There, you can learn about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these systems. All the information around these solutions is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts, and it's available to E4C members free of charge. There's a link showing where the Mobisol Solar Home System is available on our platform on this slide. Now, as always, we'd like to make sure that we all understand how to use this platform, so a few housekeeping items. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by answering the question of where you are in the world. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen, which is about in the middle of the slides. So I'll go ahead and get us started. You should be seeing my location pop up. All right, we have folks coming in here. So I'm in Brooklyn, we have folks in Minnesota and Nashville. I do see some folks answering this in the Q&A window. Uh, so we have folks from Los Angeles and Nepal. Do try to use the chat window, as this is the dedicated window uh, that is going to be for sharing remarks during the webinar. 
as well as sharing any technical questions. Uh, you can include them there or just send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. That way we can keep track of those. Um, again, if you don't see the Q&A um, window, just click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen in the, around the middle of the slide. So welcome to everybody. Wow, we have a really diverse audience today uh, from across the United States along with Nepal, Ghana, Puerto Rico, also part of the States, uh, Tokyo, Indonesia, Bissau, um, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, also part of the state. Uh, very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We're so excited to have you here. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebFX up in a different browser. Now, E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour, or PDH. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. The URL is listed here. All right, so we will try to keep today's webinar short uh, as it's uh, a little bit more digestible, um, approximately 45 minutes. Uh, so hopefully you'll get everything you need in that time. And now a little bit about our presenter. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Henry Louis is an associate professor and uh, Fort Francis Wood Endowed Research Chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seattle University. His research areas include electricity access in developing communities, renewable energy, and appropriate technology. He is the president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, a nonprofit organization providing electricity access and business opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis served as a Fulbright Scholar to Copper Belt University in Kitwe, Zambia. He is recognized as a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE and is an associate editor of the Journal of Energy for Sustainable Development. He is the author of the book, Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries, as I mentioned earlier, which was published by Springer Nature, and we are benefiting from his insights today. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Louis. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me fine wherever you might be around the world. So today we're talking about grid extension. I was giving a presentation a few years ago on some of the work my nonprofit does in off-grid electricity access in Zambia. And I was uh, describing the statistics of, of electricity access that a, a billion people don't have access to electricity around the world. And I was uh, interrupted with the question from the audience and somebody from the audience just said, well, why not? Why is it that a billion people don't have access to electricity? And it struck me at that moment that I think a lot of us practitioners that are in the off-grid space don't really think about why we are trying to solve the problem we are trying to solve. You know, why is it that after more than 100 years of, of power engineering development, we, the grid hasn't reached everywhere? And so that's really the motivation for today's talk. We're going to understand why that's the case. We're going to go through um, a few ways to compare on and off-grid solutions and so forth. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So just a, a background about me real quick. Uh, I teach at Seattle University. We're a Jesuit university located in the United States. My nonprofit organization that I uh, work with is called Kilowatts for Humanity. And in the past, I've worked for IEEE Smart Village, and I have been a Fulbright Scholar. So the book uh, that today's webinar is based off is called Off-Grid Electrical Systems in Developing Countries. It's, you can get it on Amazon, hard copy, electronic copy, through the publisher Springer's website. And there's also a link uh, on my website um, if you're interested. So today's talk is really on the third chapter of the book. The previous webinars covered the first two. So we'll be talking about grid extension and enhancement. And you see that there's a lot of other content in this book. Um, We'll go into far more detail in the book than I can cover in the next uh, 30 minutes. So if you really want to get into the details, then uh, you can download the appropriate chapter in the book. So why do we care about grid extension? Uh, it's a good question. And I think the answer is that you know, it is by far the most common way that people gain access to electricity. If you look at terms of in, in terms of investment, if you look at it in terms of the number of people connected, grid extension is really the dominant mode, at least Presently, it's the dominant, dominant mode of providing high-tier electricity access. Uh, 
In many cases, it can be faster and more cost-effective than, uh, than off-grid systems at providing high-quality uh, electricity access, so more than just uh, off-grid lighting, but providing, providing electricity access in a way that can power stoves and washing machines and so forth. And then I think even if you're, you, are, you don't care about grid extension, but you care about off-grid, many of the technical concepts and economic concepts of grid extension actually do apply to at least larger off-grid systems, like mini grids that might have their own distribution system. So the learning outcomes for today, we're going to be talking about uh, grid extension and its role in, in universal electricity access. We're going to talk about the different factors that might make grid extension preferable over off-grid. We're going to try to understand some of the basic, under, uh, basic considerations when we design distribution systems. And then we're going to talk about the economics of grid extension. So really, there's two paths to providing electricity to a community that is presently off-grid. Uh, there are off-grid solutions like solar lanterns, solar home systems, mini-grids. We talked about those somewhat in the last webinar. And then there's the on-grid approach. And in the on-grid approach, which is the subject of today's webinar, focuses on grid extension and grid en uh, enhancement. So when we talk about on-grid electrification, we're talking about the providing electricity access by extending or enhancing the existing national grid. So literally, we're, we're taking the existing electrical infrastructure and we're ex uh, extending it to reach people that presently aren't connected. And I think there's two important characteristics of this approach. The first is that we rely on the existing fleet of power plants that the country has. So we're, we're providing electricity through the, uh, electric the energy produced by hydro dams or coal-fired power plants, for example. And the reason why this is so important is the energy provided by those power plants is usually far cheaper than what a small off-grid system can provide because there's economies of scale. So you can more efficiently produce electricity with a larger power plant than a smaller one. So by connecting a community to the electrical grid, you capture some of that efficiency in production. The other advantage of on-grid electrification is that there's no storage required. The power system in the national grid is built to supply electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so you don't need to have batteries. So these are two big advantages of uh, on-grid electrification. I also want to describe briefly the difference between grid extension and grid en enhancement. A grid extension is you know, basically extending distribution lines to get to rural areas. Grid enhancement is, you know, upgrading the existing system. It could also include providing electricity access to people that are underneath the grid. So the grid doesn't really extend, they just get a connection to it. Although these are two different approaches, I'm going to just universally refer to it as grid extension just out of convenience. So I'm talking about grid extension or grid enhancement when I say grid extension. So we'll talk about the national grid next. Um, just in case you, you're not a, a power engineer. So the national grid is a collection of power plants, distribution lines, substations, and, and uh, end users. And the flow of power is typically from the power plant all the way to the end user. So we're going to kind of go through each one of these elements. And I'm, again, just going to briefly describe this grid at which we're going to extend into rural communities. So it begins at the power plant. These can be hydro plants, they can be coal-fired power plants, natural gas power plants, et cetera. Here we produce megawatts, tens of megawatts, hundreds of megawatts, or even thousands of megawatts of power. And most of these power plants are located far away from where people live. And so what we need to do is we need to increase the voltage using a step-up transformer. Let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we use uh, transformers to increase the voltage to a few hundred thousand volts. And the reason why we do this is simply because it's more efficient to send power at high voltage and low current than at low voltage and high current. So we connect the, the substation to the distribution lines, or excuse me, to the transmission lines, which would be the next, thank you. And these transmission lines are the large ones that you might see uh, you know, from your car as you drive down an interstate, they're, they're quite tall. They're usually a, a metal lattice structure, and the, they have very, very large insulators because the voltages is quite, are quite high. Uh, transmission lines can be 
hundreds or even thousands of kilometers uh, long. And their, their goal is to bring the power from the power plants to the, the load centers, the cities and the industrial areas, so that power can be consumed. Uh, there they enter the substation where we reduce the voltage, so we per perform uh, the opposite transformation. We step the voltage down to a, a, a safer level, somewhere between 11 and 33,000 volts, where we connect it to uh, distribution lines. Now, distribution lines are the lines that you see running through neighborhoods. They're on smaller poles, uh, and they are uh, at a much lower voltage. So these are the ones that the distribution lines are, are a real critical part of grid extension. And the distribution lines then terminate at distribution transformers where the voltage is again reduced, this time to maybe 100 to 400 volts, and they provide power to people's houses. So grid extension then is connecting to this existing national grid, either at a substation or to a distribution line, and connecting uh, uh, homes uh, and, and rural communities. So typically, the grid extension is, is organized by a government agency called a Rural Electrification Authority, or an REA. And so what REAs do is they come up with a, a master plan for rural electrification within that country. They might set some strategies for implementation of projects. In some cases, they actually solicit funds from international organizations to fund rural electrification. Uh, I would say that if you are working with an organization that is planning on doing any sort of rural electrification, that you consult the um, the country's REA just to make sure that your your project is um, synchronized and coherent with their plans. The last thing you want to do is invest fifty thousand dollars or so in a a mini grid, only to find the grid arrives six months later and electrifies the town that you invested all that money in. And then another important thing that REAs do is they identify electrification priorities. So, yeah. so an REA might pick a community to electrify because it has one or more of these characteristics. Uh, communities that have a high potential for electricity consumption are uh, ones that would receive priority. Typically those that are closer to the grid versus further from the grid would be given higher priority. We look for areas that are densely populated, that have potential for commerce, uh, industry, or tourism. And in addition, we might look for communities that have some sort of uh, social infrastructure like medical clinics, schools, government uh, uh, buildings, and we might target those communities. And then finally, we might target communities that have some sort of political or uh, cultural significance. So let's let's uh, consider a, a hypothetical community of Mawasi. So this is just a hypothetical community. And let's say that we're trying to figure out a way of providing electricity access to them. And so Mawasi is a, 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 a little community with about 1,000 or 2,000 people. There's about 200 households. And we're going to target providing about a kilowatt hour per household per day. And if you recall from the last lecture or the last webinar, a kilowatt hour per household per day is um, a reasonable amount of electricity consumption. And we'll, we'll assume that Mawasi is about 25 kilometers from the nearest uh, distribution line. So if we wanted to consider a, a grid extension approach to electrifying Mawasi, it would involve connecting to the existing distribution line. So you see the existing grid on the diagram on the left. We'd probably have to in, um, add a substation to connect the two lines, we'd, we'd build a new distribution line. And then along the distribution line, when we get to Mawasi, we would connect um, these distribution transformers, which would reduce the voltage to about 400 volts. And then we would connect the individual households from that. So on the right side of this slide that you see, you see what this might look like uh, in reality. So we have the three-phase distribution line coming into the top of the transformer. And then coming out of the transformer, we have the low voltage lines that uh, would connect to people's houses. So the dis it turns out that the distribution lines are uh, really important when it comes to grid extension. Uh, they're the most, cost, the most costly aspect of grid extension. Uh, here is just some, some numbers that I pulled from the Ghana National Electrification Scheme. And you can see that the cost of the distribution lines are somewhere between twenty dollars and $30,000 a kilometer. So it's actually a, a very large amount. Uh, and for, dis for communities that are 5, 10, 15, 25, or even further um, away, 
the distribution lines can be 80 or 90 percent of the, the total cost of it. So we're going to focus on distribution lines and uh, talk about some of the, the design considerations. So for Mawasi, like any other community that we might extend the grid to, when we design the distribution line, one of the most important things that we think about is what size conductor to use. Like what's that cross-sectional area? How much material, how much aluminum do we need in those cables? Well, one of the main considerations is the voltage drop. Uh, as we send power down that, that uh, distribution line to the community, the voltage encounters some uh, impedance, uh, or the current will encounter an impedance and the voltage will drop along the line. And we really want to design the line so that the community at the end of it has a high enough voltage so that their, their TVs and lights and so forth will function properly. So usually that means we want to have a, a, a voltage drop of no more than 5 or 10% along that line. If we find in our design that the voltage drop is too large, then what we would do is we would pick uh, larger, more expensive conductors. So I'll show you a few examples of what this looks like uh, on the next slide here. Yeah, so on this slide we have three different scenarios. The top one you, you can imagine just being uh, the, a, a base case. Uh, here we're sending power from the substation to the community, so point A to point B, and the voltage is going to drop along that line um, and you can see that there's an acceptable voltage drop window that's sort of highlighted in that yellow rectangle. So in this situation, the, the uh, design is sufficient to deliver power at the proper voltage at the, to the community at the end of the line. The middle diagrams here show uh, a community that is further away. So point B is, is further away from point A than, than the top diagram. And we can see that the line voltage now is actually lower than uh, the acceptable voltage drop. So this would be a, a bad uh, condition. We, would, we wouldn't want this, so this is a poor design. And so our way around this would be to actually install larger conductors, which is shown in the bottom uh, figure. So the, the distribution line is, is now uh, more substantial, and the voltage drop then is within the range. So what this shows is basically the further away a community is, not only does the line need to be longer to reach it, but the, the conductors, need, in fact, need to be bigger so that we don't have a voltage drop problem. So it becomes more and more expensive the further away uh, you go. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Now, we also have uh, losses along that line. Uh, as the, the power flows down the line, it encounters resistance, and uh, heat is generated. And that heat actually can be uh, so, so much that the line uh, mechanically fails or it starts to sag. Uh, in addition, those losses will increase with the length of the line. And so, again, to counteract these, uh, these effects, we would use larger conductors. Larger conductors reduce the resistance, and so it will reduce the losses uh, along the line. And, uh, and on the slide that you see now is just an example of how we would actually go about selecting the conductor. We would pick a conductor that meets the thermal limit so it doesn't overheat, as well as one that uh, is large enough so that we don't have a voltage drop uh, issue. So let's assume now that we've we've designed our distribution line out to Mawasi. Uh, we would then start looking at the total cost of this grid extension project. And there's two components to the cost. There's the cost of the energy and the cost of the infrastructure. And the cost of the infrastructure, uh, there are several different components. Uh, the distribution line cost, the low voltage line cost, the cost of any transformers that we might need, uh, at the, at the distribution level, so by people's houses. We have uh, a cost to modify or install a, a new substation. And then there's also the cost of wiring people's homes, adding the meters, adding the circuit breaker boxes inside people's houses, and so forth. So these would be the total costs of the infrastructure itself. So after we've um, come up with our design, we would consult uh, some vendors, or we consult a table that has uh, the prices. So here's just, these are all hypothetical. But we would uh, uh, look at our design and come up with a cost estimate. And in this case, it's about $711,000 to provide access to the, the community of Mawasi. This is actually uh, surprisingly high if you think about it. There's only 200 homes that we are targeting to provide uh, grid extension electricity access to. And the total cost per connection is uh, over $3,000, so 3555 really. So that's quite a bit of money to, to extend the grid 
to that community. So we can look at that cost in a few ways. Uh, we can imagine that you know, the, the distribution line that runs to Mawasi, which is 25 kilometers long, maybe it passes a closer community that's only 10 kilometers away. Well, we can repeat the cost estimate for that community and we can see that electrifying 200 homes there would only cost $400,000. And then if we also think of maybe there's a community that's right underneath the grid to connect 200 homes might cost just $100,000. So as we go further and further away from the existing grid, it becomes a much more expensive proposition to provide access to electricity. And I think maybe a more meaningful way of looking at this is in terms of the connections that could be made given that same budget. So if we had a budget of $711,000, we might have the option of connecting 200 people in Milwaukee or close to 400 people in maybe some community that's not quite as far out. But if we focus entirely on people that were underneath the existing grid, the grid passes over their heads, but their, their home isn't connected, we could connect almost 1,200 households. So if we look at the per connection costs, you can see uh, that there's quite a, quite a range. And so if you're the the Rural Electrification Authority or if you're the government and your goal was to provide access to more people, you know, which option would you pick? Would you connect Mawasi, uh, the community that's along the way, or those that are under the grid? And I think this underscores one of the reasons why the grid hasn't made it out into the rural areas is it's just you get more bang for your buck. You connect more people per dollar if you start in areas that already have a distribution line, already have access to electricity, you simply can connect the many homes that aren't already connected. Uh, you might think that people in urban areas already have access to electricity, but that's really not the case. There's still many that, that don't. So in addition to that overnight infrastructure cost, we're usually interested in converting that to an annual cost of infrastructure. And I won't get into that into too much detail here. It's covered more in the book. But basically, there's a, a well-known financial equation that you can apply to come up with what the annual cost of, of um, any infrastructure project is. So on the next slide here, we've done that calculation for uh, the Great Extension Project to Mawasi. And we see that for a 30-year lifespan of the project, it's going to cost uh, $43,000 each uh, and every year over that 30-year period. Uh, so that's another way of looking at it, but it's also useful uh, to look at it in terms of cost per uh, connection. And here we have 200 connections, so uh, it ends up being about $217 per home in Mawasi each year that you would need to collect from in order to pay for that distribution line. And $217 is quite a bit of money to a rural household. But we haven't talked about the cost of energy yet. So we, we have to remember that the electricity comes from somewhere. And there is a cost of, of having that power plant, uh, of its fuel, its maintenance, and so forth. So there are a couple of ways of, of putting a, a number on the cost of energy. And one of them is called the levelized cost of energy. And you can think of the levelized cost of energy as the, the cost of energy that you, uh, the price that you'd have to sell a kilowatt hour for in order to break even on your power plant. So you're not making a profit, but you are covering all of your costs. Uh, we cover this in more detail in the book, but for now let's, let's assume that the cost for Mawasi, the levelized cost of energy in the country that Mawasi is in is, um, is 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So then we can do a quick calculation to figure out what the energy cost for Mawasi is. It's simply 15 cents a kilowatt hour times 365 kilowatt hours a year times the number of homes, which is 200. And we get the cost then of providing electricity to Mawasi, which is $10,950. In fact, it's going to be a bit higher than this because we've, we've ignored losses for the sake of simplicity, but we'll just, we'll just assume that this figure here is correct. So the energy costs, uh, when added to the infrastructure costs, uh, and again, this is on an annual basis, it ends up being uh, $54,335 uh, per year. So in other words, that's how much money it costs the utility or the government to provide the, the, the community of Mawasi um, energy in, in the amount of 365 kilowatt hours per household per year. So we can look at this a few different ways. We can look at it as the, the cost per connection each year. 
and uh, it ends up being about $271, or the cost per kilowatt hour supplied, uh, which ends up being closer to $0.74 cents a kilowatt hour. And so this begs a, a very uh, reasonable question is, well, are these costs appropriate? Is this okay? Uh, could a rural community afford this? Can they afford to pay $0.74 cents a kilowatt hour for their electricity? Can they uh, afford a $271 uh, uh, a, a year fee for their electricity access? And most likely the, the answer is no. Um, remember, we have a target of 5% a year, no more than 5% a year spent on electricity costs uh, for these rural communities, and almost surely uh, $271 a year is greater than 5% of that, that uh, household's income. So the reality of grid extension is and this is true not just in developing countries, but in, for example, the United States, is that when you extend the power grid to rural areas, it's often a, a loss-making proposition for the utility. In other words, they, they're going to lose money by doing this. The distribution line costs are just that high. So what that means is the rural electrification is subsidized by the government. So the, the community might pay one rate for electricity, but it's going to actually be below what it costs the government to provide that same amount of electricity. So governments tend to do this either to spur development or maybe there's some political reasons or maybe because they, they get a grant to, to, to do so. But we ne always need to remember that the government is actually losing money on each kilowatt hour of electricity they provide. And so there's this, this incentive or disincentive um, to connect people. Uh, in, in rural areas. When the government starts to subsidize electricity, um, it actually can do a, a disservice. It can have like sort of an opposite effect. It can discourage international investment in electrical infrastructure, uh, but it also uh, affects off-grid entrepreneurs, those that might want to privately install a mini-grid and, and sell electricity. They're not capturing that subsidy in most countries. And so you see a very, very large difference between the electricity rate that is charged for mini grid operate um, for mini grid customers versus those that are connected to the grid. And most of the time, the rural communities uh, don't really understand why there's such a large difference. So, what about off grid? We we see that extending the grid to Mawasi is. Uh, can only really be done if it's subsidized, at least from an economic standpoint. But what about off-grid? Well, we can look at these two figures, the $271 and the $0.74 cents a kilowatt hour, and that serves as a benchmark for an off-grid solution. So if we can come up with an off-grid system that can provide the same amount of energy for less than $270 a year uh, per household, then you can say that this off-grid solution is, is a favorable uh, outcome versus uh, an on-grid solution. Similarly, if it can provide it at a cost of less than $0.74 cents a kilowatt hour, then an off-grid solution uh, might be uh, cost competitive. And so you would pursue that instead of extending the grid. Uh, more generally, we can look at the decision to provide an on-grid versus off-grid solution uh, as the graph that's shown on this slide. So the grid extension costs we know will increase as the distance between the existing grid and the community uh, also increases. So communities that are further away, of course, have higher grid extension costs. The cost for an off-grid system, however, is going to be pretty much the same no matter if that off-grid system is, is installed right next to the distribution line or 100 kilometers away. So it's, it's going to be just a horizontal line. Now, there's going to be a point where these two lines intersect, the grid extension cost line and the off-grid system cost line. And to the left of that point, grid extension is going to be economically favorable, and to the right, the off-grid system is going to be favorable. So you can see that communities that are closer to the grid, you're more likely to extend the grid to them, at least from an economic standpoint, it's more sensible. And as we go further and further from the grid, off-grid systems, uh, in fact, make more sense. So to summarize that point here on the next slide, uh, when we think about communities that should be um, connected via grid extension, we think of communities that are near the existing grid as well as having high consumption. Uh, the more energy that the community uses, the more favorable grid extension will be. And this is because, again, energy from the grid is generally cheaper than energy from an off-grid system. Uh, 
So for communities that are far from the grid, who might only need lighting or, or electricity for cell phone charging, those are perfect communities for off-grid solutions because the, the consumption is low and the grid extension costs would be simply too high to, to add the infrastructure to reaching them. So to kind of summarize uh, the point here, we might consider grid extension to a community because, first of all, it can be more expensive, or less expensive, I should say, than an off-grid solution in terms of infrastructure and, and in terms of energy. But of course, that's not absolute. It depends on several factors, most, most importantly, the distance between the community and the existing grid. We might do grid extension because it's familiar. So even, even if the community is far away, well, we have, you know, most countries have lots of trained power engineers who know how to build distribution lines and substations. So it's a familiar uh, exercise in a way the utility knows exactly what they're getting into uh, because it's, it's something that they've done before. There's also existing codes and regulations and oversight for grid extension, and there's less, that's less so for off-grid systems. And then the grid can offer a higher quality uh, electricity access tier uh, than an off-grid solution. And I say that sort of with a caveat and that in many countries, the, the grid connected power is very unreliable. Uh, the voltage uh, varies widely throughout the day. And in some cases, off-grid is even better, uh, can offer better reliability. So the other side of the coin is off-grid solutions. So we might consider an off-grid solution if the wait for grid extension is too long. Maybe the community is close enough to the grid where grid extension is actually the more economically favorable uh, outcome, but perhaps it's going to be 10 years or longer before that, that grid will realistically reach that community. So if we don't want to wait, then an off-grid solution might make sense. Um, we, if the grid is unreliable, then an off-grid solution might make sense. And then again, in certain scenarios, off-grid systems uh, can ultimately be less expensive than, than on-grid solutions. So let's move on to kind of wrap things up here. Um, so why isn't the grid everywhere? Well, I think uh, the line of thought goes like this. Well, the grid isn't everywhere because governments and utilities, they have limited budgets for infrastructure projects, especially in many of these developing countries that struggle with electricity access. And grid extension is an expensive proposition, uh, both in absolute terms and in, in cost per connection terms. So to supply electricity to those 200 homes in Mawasi, it costs uh, you know, closer to a million dollars. Uh, that's quite a bit of money for a, a smaller country, for example. So it's an expensive proposition. And then if we do decide to invest in that infrastructure, uh, we're going to do it at a loss. So that money we're not really going to recuperate, and it's going to be subsidized then. And uh, that you could argue that the subsidy then is pulling money away from the government's bank account that could be used on other development goals like improved health care, uh, education, sanitation, et cetera. So if you have to decide, would your other people have more resources for electricity or, uh, for example, better uh, health care. And then finally, it's more efficient to, more cost efficient anyway, to provide access to electricity to, to uh, people that live very close to the grid, or they live in a large city and, and then fortunately they're not connected to the grid. So connecting those people first is just a more efficient use of money. So the grid really hasn't reached the rural areas uh, because in many countries, we're still working on the low-hanging fruit. We are still trying to connect urban centers, people living in urban centers, to the grid, uh, and we haven't made our way out to the, the rural areas. We don't have the money to do it, and uh, it's simply uh, just not uh, economical. So I'll summarize then the main points of this, this webinar. Um, grid extension is usually the least expensive way of providing electricity access, provided that you're close to the grid. Uh, that seems obvious uh, now, but oftentimes we don't really think of it in those terms. Uh, when we compare off-grid to on-grid uh, connection schemes, off-grid is really favorable for communities that are far from the grid, uh, that consume small amounts of energy, that are dispersed, uh, and that are not prioritized for grid extension, so the wait might be too long. Uh, distribution lines are often the most expensive part 
of the system and we need to design them to uh, have an acceptable voltage drop and to, to minimize losses, but that those, uh, those designs that use larger conductors add to the cost, of course. And that when we consider any sort of grid extension or even off-grid approach, we need to consider the infrastructure costs as well as the energy costs. And I think the calculation that makes sense is the annual cost per connection or per unit uh, energy described. That way we have uh, an apples to apples comparison. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to be talking about during uh, next month's webinar is we're going to focus on energy conversion technologies. So off-grid systems, you know, how we, how we power them, and in particular, we're going to cover um, in some detail generator sets, uh, PV systems, microhydropower, uh, wind energy, and biomass systems. So that's going to be uh, in December, and you can check out the E4C website for uh, registration details. So with that, um, there's some references, and I'm happy to uh, field any questions that we might have in the remaining uh, time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. And uh, for those of you who are watching the webinar, my apologies for the back and forth on some of the slides. Uh, we had a little challenge advancing the slides, so I was trying to take cues from Henry <laughs> as to when the transition was going to be, and we might have been off on a few of them, so hopefully that didn't cause anybody too much eye strain. So uh, right now, uh, it's an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have uh, to, to Henry regarding the grid extension um, and uh, open up the floor here. If we have any questions, it was quite uh, a thorough uh, uh, webinar. We do have a question. We have, um, so Ignatius, if you don't mind putting your question into the chat, but unlike the virtual salon that we recently had, this will be a uh, requires us to uh, type all our questions. So while we wait for questions to arrive, um, perhaps, uh, Henry, uh, if you have some insight, what have been um, some uh, kind of um, patterns or trends that you've seen in terms of grid extension decisions by governments in consideration of off-grid uh, projects or solutions that are happening kind of in parallel. Do, is there a tension uh, or is there, does the government even consider what players are in country developing uh, those solutions and deploying them as part of their overall equation in determining whether grid extension is reasonable? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So it, it depends on the country and what we're seeing in uh, in East Africa, uh, Kenya, and Tanzania, and, and uh, Nigeria, and a few other countries, the governments are understanding that off-grid electrific electrification um, using off-grid systems is, is going to, they see the potential for it. And so what they're doing is they're working to develop regulations that uh, provide those companies that wish to do off-grid systems, uh, they provide some clarity and consistency in how they're going to be treated. Uh, they're describing and defining what's going to happen to a mini-grid when the grid uh, eventually gets there, you know, who owns that asset and so forth. So I think the my perspective is that the utilities, the, the governments are understanding, they're seeing the potential of off-grid, and you're going to see a lot more coordination in the upcoming years. Uh, in the past, they've virtually ignored, uh, you know, any sort of off-grid system, and, and grid extension has really been their mindset. And I think we're starting yeah. to get some momentum in, in the other way. And so it's really exciting to see how this is going to shake out and what policies are going to spur off-grid development and which ones uh, might not work so well. So it's a very uh, exciting time. Yeah, indeed. So we have a few questions that have come in. So for people to be under the grid at some point, a grid was expanded, even um, if it wasn't a quote unquote good idea at the time or it had a low ERR. Isn't this also a way of expanding and then having low hanging fruits? And the low hanging fruit in this case is in reference to those under the grid homes or urban homes that were not connected. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Uh, and the example that we did in this webinar was rather simplistic. I mean, 
uh, hopefully the um, the utility would would identify communities between the existing grid and uh, and the community of Mawasi, and so it wouldn't just be one one community. Although certainly I've seen grid extension that are you know 10, 20 kilometers that only do is connect a, a health clinic. They bypass all those homes. Yeah, so oh, wow. it's it's very common to see uh, distribution lines going over people's homes in rural areas. Uh, and it's a little strange because uh, the the utilities will often require very very hefty connection fees. So they they plan on investing and in bringing a distribution line to a community, but they're going to charge uh, you know 500 U.S. dollars to connect to it. And many homes just they can't do it, so so they're simply mm -hmm. not connected. So that explains it. Um, so yeah, a, a, a strategic approach could be you're going to build the distribution line, and then uh, the people will. Then Eventually, save up enough money to be connected. <laughs> uh, and yeah. You, you, yeah. So that might make sense and in some areas. Yep. Yes, in particular when we're talking about urban context and rapid urban population growth. And, sure. And in, in, in that frame of mind, also um, informal settlements within urban centers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here that's kind of speaking to that is population growth a factor in how difficult it has been to connect everyone? Would Can you just Pand a little bit on that, particularly when we're talking about uh, urban centers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in uh, you know the, the population, the rate of growth of population in, in many countries in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is just astronomical. Uh, the amount of investment you need to make just to kind of keep even is is incredible. So yeah, utilities are struggling to connect people in formal as well as informal settlements. It absolutely makes makes a difference, especially if the electricity rate is subsidized. Again, they have a mm -hmm. they have sort of a disincentive to connect people if they lose money, and it's not like these utilities are flush with cash. You know, most of the time they are they are struggling to make their own payments to their suppliers. Uh, so it's it's a it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. They can't afford um, to subsidize really everyone and every connection. So they have to pick the ones that make the most sense, and uh, and then you know sort of work their way up the the tree from the low hanging fruit. So um, there was another very specific question, and we have quite a few questions, so we'll try to tackle all of these. <laughs> okay, is, the LCOE, uh, is the LCOE a correct metric to compare off-grid and on-grid cost of power delivery to customers? Well, it, I would say yes. What you need to do, though, is you need to make sure you account for um, the infrastructure costs. So the levelized cost of energy we usually do for particular power plants, uh, and we might ignore the the transmission and distribution costs. So if you want to include uh, compare on-grid to off-grid, you would calculate the levelized cost of energy, including the infrastructure costs. So you, it's similar to what we did here in, in the webinar, although albeit it was a little simplistic and we just sort of bestowed a levelized cost of energy of 15 cents a kilowatt hour. But I, I'd say it's certainly f uh, a fair approach to do. Obviously, you could come up with a more rigorous model, but for the purposes of explaining the concept, absolutely it makes sense. So there's uh, actually another follow-up question that is more um, of a case study kind of question. So this particular mm -hmm. listener um, had visited a village in rural Kenya uh, that is powered by a microgrid. However, uh, he found that it was kind of um, in, <laughs> curious that there was a 33 kilovolt line that passed less than 10 meters from the village. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it might have been advised to install a microgrid in this location where a step-down transformer would have been much cheaper if we're looking <laughs> at pure economics? Yeah. Um, so maybe you could kind of shed some light as to maybe the same yeah. thing that. Absolutely. So this is a fantastic question uh, and something that I've, I've noticed as well. I was actually just talking to somebody about this uh, last night in Zambia where a microgrid was installed across the street from uh, a 33 kV line. So it's not just that case in Kenya. Um, we get contacted, my nonprofit, by organizations that want to do solar uh, for a school or a medical clinic, and then we always ask them, well, how far away is the, the grid? And in some cases, the grid is, you know, this is a the grid is there, and they just want they don't want to pay an electricity bill. And so in their mind, they think, oh, if we have solar, things will be cheaper. And that's usually the exact opposite. Um, so why we see mini grids in places where the grid is, um, there has to be 
so, at least I'd like to think that there's some other maybe non non obvious reason like the the distribution line itself was not designed to handle additional load, so that could be one example. So in other words, they designed that distribution line based on a certain number of customers and they've reached that limit and they simply don't want to upgrade that line to accommodate the customers served by the mini grid. That could be one possibility. Um, I think another possibility is that maybe the the utility would connect the customers that the mini grid are connected to, but the wait might be too long. And they say, okay, we we'll do it, but we'll do it in you know 18 to 36 months. And maybe for whatever reason, they didn't uh, the mini grid uh, customers didn't want to wait that long. Uh, another reason okay. could be that the the utility is waiting for more customers before they will install a transformer. So it costs a lot of money to install a transformer, and if there's just a small number of customers connected uh, to the microgrid, uh, they might have asked the utility to connect, and the utility said, well, we'll do it, but we need to have at least 50 customers. So th those are some, some possible reasons, um, but it could also just be poor planning by the microgrid implementer. They didn't know the grid was coming, or they didn't care that it was there. Yeah, Maybe they so had a grant or something. Absolutely. Exactly. Always, like always, faster. always check to see where the grid is and if the grid is coming before you do anything like anything like that, before you install mini grid. Words to the wise here. So the, this is, I think uh, there's somebody else who had asked a question regarding cost analysis and on-grid and off-grid systems and incorporating factors that might come uh, from the level of electricity access. And I think this particular case study was actually quite good in demonstrating some of those factors. Um, and then, uh, so one question is, if a community is connected to an uh, quote unquote unreliable national grid with large voltage fluctuations, are there other devices required to protect equipment from over or under voltage conditions? Uh, absolutely, you can get, uh, you can get uh, protection devices that will protect against uh, higher voltages. Lower voltages, not so much, or at least not in a, I mean, you can buy what's called um, uh, a universal power supply, which is basically your own little battery backup, and it, when the grid goes away, it will provide nice, clean power. So that's that's one technology. Those are quite expensive. Um, in terms of larger infrastructure, you know, you can have transformers that adjust the voltage uh, dynamically, but again, those are pretty expensive to do. Uh, a lot of A lot of equipment can these days can handle a fluctuation of, of voltage um, without without damage, but lower quality, inexpensive appliances and things that you might actually see in these in this this uh, rural context, there are probably going to be less likely to have that built-in robustness. So um, uh -huh. it's yeah it, it, it's uh, unfortunate, and somebody probably could do a study at the cost of. Um, of those voltage fluctuations and like to get a better sense of what's the true economic burden on having to replace lights, televisions, and so forth due to damage uh, uh -huh. for, yeah. And, and maybe that will make mini grids even more appealing because you don't, that could be a selling point uh, is that you don't have that large fluctuation. Great question. That's, yeah, it's a very good point. So there's a couple of questions I'm going to end with, and I think many of them actually set us up nicely for upcoming webinars. Uh, one is, are there any generating devices outside of those listed that are available for rural villages? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, the ones that, that I uh, that we're going to talk about, gensets, PV, microhydro, wind, biomass, um, I think those are the the main ones. Um, there are there could be some niche ones um, that might come up in very specific locations, but uh, those are the those are really the main ones. And in fact, I mean, PV is is I'm sure uh, the fastest growing. Uh, there's probably more gen sets out there than than PV systems, or it's going to be pretty close. You don't see very much wind. Microhydro really only works in places where you have that you know a water resource that's adequate. Um, and biomass is really just a different fuel for a gen set. Um, so those are the main ones that you see. Uh, human power generation, things like that, really, I don't know that there's been a lot of success stories around around that. Tidal geothermal, those are, you know, I mean, I don't know that there's many of those systems that are out there for small scale. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Exactly. So for those of you who are interested, just as a uh, for reference point, again, Henry will be speaking about these in the upcoming webinar. And if you want to learn in advance or just kind of explore what's out there, we encourage you to check out the E4C Solutions Library. We actually have a variety of examples of these particular technology categories, genset, photovoltaic, microhydro, wind energy, and biomass systems that you can peruse. Um, to see what is out there and including human power and some options uh, and to kind of make your own initial assessments. And we're going to wrap up with the last question because I've completely lied to everybody here about our 45 minute <laughs> limit because we have this rich conversation. Um, so how do you feel about various energy delivery business models like solar lanterns working uh, for off-grid electrification? Do you think they are reliable enough? Again, maybe something that's leading into upcoming webinars or uh, past webinars but I'll let you tackle that one, Henry, as a closing question. Yeah, I, I think most people would say that solar uh, home system, well, solar lanterns in particular are, are great, but they're not, that shouldn't be, uh, that, that's not the final goal. I mean, I think the final goal should really be grid-like uh, electricity access, so uh, enough electricity not to just power lights and recharge cell phones, but to do some of those uh more important or at least higher quality electricity services like refrigeration and uh, maybe even a, a electric stoves. So solar lanterns, uh, sure, uh, and high quality ones. Uh, I mean, I have one that I use here in my office, actually, believe it or not. Uh, they last a really long time and they're quite reliable. I don't think I've ever had this, this thing go out when I've needed it. Um, but there's a lot of counterfeit ones on the market. And so it's very easy for the impression that they're low uh, for them not to be reliable. Uh, I mean, there's there's actually a basis in that, and that a lot of counterfeit ones go out there, and, and people have that perception. Uh -huh. Yeah, the energy access tier is, is low, and I think we we should aim higher as a as a uh, community and as an industry. So, um, Henry, would you be willing to detain just a couple more questions? We had them sure. come in. Yeah. I I mean, just uh, just for yeah, the people want to keep of kind of talking. <laughs> the yeah. So. Yeah, you can also uh, put my contact uh, info yeah. slide in yeah. there and people can Absolutely. contact me on Twitter or, or email. Yeah. Absolutely, there you go. So sure. um, what role do you see international utilities or energy companies playing in grid extension or enhancements? Oh, uh, gosh, that, that I'm sure that varies widely from country to country because it, you know, most of these utilities are are owned by the government or they're parastatal or sort of quasi-government. So the government would have to uh, to you know, sort of welcome their investments. Um, there's been some rumors in some countries that the government is using their utilities as collateral for loans and, and things like that, but I don't know uh -huh. how, how true there, how true that is. Uh, I would, I think that, uh, I think that these governments should actually welcome international investment in their power systems, especially because, um, you know, they've done, many countries have just struggled to keep up with population growth. That was uh, the question earlier. So international investment, Sure. Um, you need to, you know, when we talk about power grids, I mean, if you look at the United States, for example, there's so many different models of, of investor-owned utilities versus municipal utilities, you know, versus, you know, special utility districts. There's a lot of different ways that it can work. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's very possible that you know, an international company could come in and inject some finance and some capital into a much needed power system. Uh, I think certainly in the off-grid space, we're seeing that actually happen uh, where more and more off-grid companies are, are getting uh, financed and they're able to install more mini grids. And I mean, it's still a very dynamic <laughs> business landscape uh -huh. to see if these companies are truly sustainable and, and can generate profit in the long run, but it's an exciting time to, to see what will happen. And um, I think, you know, the more, the more uh, attention that this problem gets is really the better, you know, the, the, we'll find solutions that, that uh, will work, work us towards universal electricity access for sure. Uh, I love your optimism. So, uh, uh, and I agree. I'm, I'm with you on that. And finally, last question. I promise this time, if you could share any perspective about interconnected microgrids, and by interconnected, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, listener means with utility main grids or amongst each other, and what mm -hmm. actions that entails from the utilities or regulators. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. I actually, I maybe have a, a more pessimistic approach or, or thought on on, on this, this fact. Um, so, I mean, strategically, you know, in the systems that I've worked with and 
I would I would put my mini grids in a place where the grid isn't coming anytime soon. Uh, so that means that when I design it, I'm maybe less worried about making it backwards compatible with the actual grid itself, uh, thinking that by the time the grid gets there, you know, maybe the inverter uh, or some of the other components will need to be replaced anyway. They'll be at the end of their service life. Um, I think also when we talk about mini grids in rural communities connecting with each other, boy, I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> so uh -huh. I'm glad that people are, are thinking about it, but there's just so much, so many communities so far from each other that don't have a mini grid to begin with that worrying about how we're going to connect them is maybe a, a problem for, you know, 10 years down the road at least, not, not, uh, not next week, not it's, I don't think it's holding anything back. I think it's a fantastic topic to study now, sort of in the research phase, but um, you know, many of these communities are so rural that even to connect from one community to the next, that is going to require quite a bit of investment. Uh -huh. and, and it might, might not make sense to um, future-proof them now, knowing that it's going to cost more money. So lower costs, I think, right now is um, maybe more important. So, and I'm sure I've talked to other folks that have a different view than, than I do on that. So my caveat is I'm a little pessimistic about how rapidly grids will extend, mini grids will extend, and so forth. Well, I think uh, balanced with your extreme optimism on the other <laughs> side, you come out neutral. So I think we're all okay. So uh, this, I promised that was the last question. That is the last question. I, I really uh, do appreciate everybody participating and sharing mm -hmm. uh, these thoughtful questions. These are really great, and I hope they've been useful for you. For those of you who are speaking, uh, we're going we're gonna to be closing out. I want to thank you all for attending, and certainly I want to thank Henry for presenting and continuing to dedicate himself for another several webinars to really dig deep into these topics. We're so excited for the one that's upcoming in December. Uh, for those of you who are interested in PDHs, please uh, click on the link or uh, grab that link that you see in front of you to apply for your PDH. If we didn't tap all your questions, feel free to email Henry directly or email us if you didn't catch his email. And of course, don't forget to become a 4C member so that we can send you information in upcoming webinars. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Henry. And a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. We remember where you're from, and we're looking forward to catching you on the next D4C webinar. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Great.